to produce a very small amount of milk. Yeah, I mean, when, when I talk about when I talk about intensive farming, it, it's me and dairy. It, it absolutely is because the mega dairies are really a big concern. And you know, we've been involved in the power thing. We're involved with Whispa on it, and just last week, who are very involved in this mega dairy because the situation there is that we're talking about the cows being kept indoors 100% of the time. Um, these are grazing animals, and they don't seem to th see that there's a problem with animals that are designed to graze. They're designed to graze. They've got four stomachs, for the sake, so that they are designed to eat grass that we can't eat. We can't graze into grass. They're designed to eat grass and convert it into milk for their calves. Yeah, that is fundamentally what they do. And yet we're being told, oh no, they don't, they don't need to go outside, they're happier inside, there's this disease risk inside. Um, this, this is the messages that are being put out there. And certainly it's an issue that I've been doing some work on, to say whisper doing some work on, we're trying to get research um, to show the behavioural need to actually graze. But you know, that's quite difficult to do, and it's much easier. The industry often talks about welfare and health being the same thing. So they're like, they're healthy indoors, they don't get diseases, therefore their welfare must be good. And we have to keep saying, no, welfare is not just about health, it's about a life worth living, it's about being able to carry out normal behaviours for these animals. So, you know, women's research will go in, it's a massive issue. Say something about how natural resources might be on our side, meaning you know, the, the economic cost of the meat is expensive, that kind of factor. I mean, I think, I think that meat prices are only going one way, and that's up. Um, so people will be forced to eat their meat, if you like. Um, but you know, that argument then plays into the, to the hands of you know, the increasing intensification, and this is what we're seeing. Um, you know, they're sort of saying, um, you know, people need meat, which of course we know isn't true, and we have, we have to fight, fight that as well. Um, you know, we don't, we know that you don't need to eat meat, but, you know, meat is going to become increasingly expensive because the feed that feeds the meat is going to become increasingly expensive. But if we allow that to be the way that people don't get meat, then it means that people in developing countries with less money or with land that's been bought up by other people are going to starve, um, you know, and the food that ought to be going to them will be feeding animals to create what will become a premium product. And so natural forces will discriminate against the world. Yeah, and it's, it's already happening. I mean, there are some awful stories about land grabbing. And that land, I think the figure is about two thirds of, of the land in developing countries that's being bought up by developed countries is for animal feed and wild food. I don't know how much it is, but that's what it is. So I think while you might think that's a, a sort of, oh, in some ways that would be a good thing, the effects elsewhere uh, are devastating. And in fact, there was a very interesting report. And yeah, so according to the International Food Policy Research Unit, this is, it's not a radical unit by any means, um, a 50% reduction in meat consumption in the developed world would save 3.6 million children from malnutrition. So that shows that I think is really there. What's on our plates in this country is directly sort of causing malnutrition. And that only took into account grain harvests and prices. And it didn't take into account constraints such as water, land, and energy costs. So actually, it's probably millions and millions more than that. So um, I think that makes Uh, yes, it's mainly uh, the common agricultural policy. One, one argument that we have been effective in such a way that we've tried to put on the first scale is to get an indirect subsidy on the uh, animal feed for the first scale. Yeah, and then the second scale is to get the animal feed on the second scale. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. And that's what the government has done. They have been very successful in that isn't that something of a, 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 a I think the 
common agricultural policy is full of our goals. It has come so far from where it started, you know, to, to develop food security. Um, and it's become, it's very much about individual countries all trying to protect their own farmers. It's kind of the European project on the wrong. And Greens do have an alternative kind of vision for the common agricultural policy. We think that there is um, a role for it, but that basically all the money, instead of going in, I won't go into the detail, but instead of going to single farm payments, basically just throwing money at the farmers, it doesn't matter what they do, it goes into um, a very restructured kind of two, which is all about um, basically going towards agroecology. So, you know, supporting those local farmers, producing healthy, safe food, quality food, food that has taste, for example, um, you know, seasonal food, vegetables, you know, it's about completely changing the cap. So it gives us the sort of farming that we need. Well, I said the political um, contributions of the green movement is for everyone to have their own allotment and to be living as self-sufficient as possible and without our cities and, and uh, in environments that are more fit for animals and pets and things. Um, if that was the case, I'm to forget the England being as super picturesque as it could possibly be, that, that would mean decimating, we would have to decimate the growth rate. What do you do? Population is an issue that often comes up, um, and I think that it's dangerous to um, to sort of really focus on, on population in the way because it's not necessarily all about numbers, it's about what we consume. And the problem is that like in this country we're living like a 10 planet lifestyle. Um, and you know it's obviously really important in terms of population. Our policies are choice, access to contraception, and choice for people. Um, and what we find is that you know when people have the choice, you know the choose to have just children population comes down. But you know we would never enforce that. I and mean, we would say that really the issue is about the level of consumption that you have. And actually, you know, well, I, don't, I don't think that as as Greens. We don't say the sort of city is bad. Um, I mean, they are quite bad in their current form, but actually, some forms of very um, intensive, sort of high density living can be quite green. But you do need to think about where that, where the food comes from, and certainly, you know, looking at you know how we create food supplies for London. So sort of going back to the sort of market gardens model, um, some local growing projects. You know, there's a lot of different things that you can do. I think I think I have a very good friend who's a health trainer, um, and that has been really eye-opening to me. There are very complicated reasons why people don't need the right diet. Complicated social reasons, psychological reasons, reasons about education, reasons about access to. Um, you know, the, the knowledge to, to cook or even the pans, you know, it's very easy to criticise someone who gets in, goes to take away, gets to back. It is. Um, but I think we need to sometimes put ourselves in those people's shoes. Um, you know, where's that, where's that decision come from? And, you know, actually, you know, my friend is a health trainer. Um, I honestly wouldn't criticise those. Uh, if you type in all these cures and so you get like, hundreds of pages of feelings that are cured themselves that are all being in the market. Do you think this is a good idea about that? I mean, we have policies on, as I say, on education and about the importance of providing meat free diets, vegan diets, um, you know, in schools and hospitals and educating people about it. And, I, you know, there's a lot of health benefits coming through, and it's, as I explained, very important that we. And make sure that health professionals are aware of that. And there's some really you know, good examples built into being a classic one. Um, but we need to be aware that people don't actually have choice. People don't have as much choice as we might think because they haven't all had just necessarily the education. And they are being bombarded by incredibly sophisticated 
advertising, pressure um, from industries that know exactly what they're doing, like fast food industries. I mean, a very small example is traffic light labelling. Traffic light labelling, you would not think that it's a big drama. We want our food decently labelled, a nice traffic light system, red for bad, amber for medium, and green for good, on salt for fat, etc. It seems like a really good idea. Surely everyone wants to know what their food contains. This went to the European Union, and of course, Greens massively supported it. One billion pounds was spent by the food lobbying organisations in Brussels. And some politicians, unfortunately, get persuaded by that sort of thing. And we don't have traffic light labelling across the EU. This is the power that we're up against, and it's why you know, we need to be organised and you know, work together with all our different organisations. And we are up against um, you know, the big. Um, I'm going to come to some other questions now, if that's okay. Um, one of the things that changed earlier this year was that public health came back into local authority control and the health and well-being boards went by, so that means that now a bit more um, political involvement in every, every authority across the country um, about the wider health and well-being of the population. I think we should be making more use of that. Absolutely. And I mean, I think certainly it's, it's good for the Greens as well, because we do have Sort of representation on councils, whereas it's you know more difficult for us to get representation on um, at the national level. And it also means that as kind of individuals in the local community, um, you know, if you can just gather a few people together, it's a lot of councils. It's it's not so difficult to you know ask the question of your council, as you find out who your councillors are, and actually ask, you know, what are you doing on this issue? You know, what sort of food have they got in at the council? Procurement. I meant to mention it. Actually, procurement decisions are really a powerful way of making changes. Um, government spends about two billion pounds on buying sort of different different you know food for prisons and hospitals and everything. And councils just have a lot of power as well. And they have choices. They can make choices. And you know we can influence those choices. And if they make a change and they then put that money into more local food, more vegan food, then that really helps build um, you know, the industry. So I think it's a really good point, and as you know, get, get involved, find out what the local council's doing, because um, there's a lot that, that they can do, and often they don't, they don't, they don't even realise. Uh, a couple of weeks ago in the House of Commons, uh, an MP, I can't remember who it was, uh, called for a control of cattle fit, I don't know who that is. This is a PSC crisis, it's a little bit <laughs> Uh, so I was wondering, have you heard any, um, is there any pressure from the industry for relaxation on the or can you offer them our own steps to help themselves to not I haven't heard of any pressure. I think it would be completely ridiculous for them to do it because I think it, it would actually help our, us if they tried to make that case. You know, that the industry still thinks after everything that is acceptable to feed animals to help with us. Um, you know, I think we could run a really big campaign on that actually. I mean, I don't know. But um, it, it, it does go to show the thinking of many of these stories, I think, around agriculture. Um, certainly, fish meal is, is fed cows. Um, I mean, we could, I could talk for a very long time about the problems of fishing and, and establish farming, but we won't go, we won't go into that. Um, so, and you know, the effect of soil as well. So the whole, the whole thing, the whole message that cows, cattle, aren't fed on grass anymore, it's quite an important one. Because even some friends of mine, they're like, oh, but you know, if you don't have dairy, is it nice to have the cows in the fields? And just like that, it's not the life of the cow anymore. You know, and I think when they realise, they're shocked. Um, someone at the back. Thanks, Caroline. I thought excellent speech. Just from my perspective, having worked on food from organic to also international intensive business that you've discussed, um, one thing that strikes me, the model's not sustainable, you've made that very clear. And 
is a role, I think, a great role for governments because the free market running the market is not going to solve that problem. You know, if you've got nine and a half people by 2050, nine and a half billion on this planet, the figures speak for themselves. I think we're going to have to feed more in the next 50 years than last 10,000 combined. It's the figure I used to use a lot when I worked with big agrochemical industry and telling their, you know, their story about why they needed to use pesticides. But it is a shocking figure. But the problem is that you know, if we're all going to feed meat the way we are, it's all going to break down. You're using too much water, too much of the world's resources. So you've got to go back to a plant-based diet and then how we actually diversify that. Because it is very much a monoculture of crops that we develop around the world. A lot of expertise and knowledge is being lost in different ethnic communities about what is good food, historical things in different regions, and more control about their food supply chains. What worries me is that governments have sort of stepped away from food security and allow to a large degree the private sector to fill the gap with investment and technology and then they control its use. And that opens the debate about GM and other things. But I just wondered how you had a vision of the Green Party about the need for governments to get involved in what is the basic necessity of life, keeping us all fed, dealing with global poverty, and trying to tackle some of these health and environmental problems in a more joined up approach, rather than just leaving it to, to companies to do as they please, be they you know, companies involved in intensive livestock production or biotechnology development, whatever. I think there's a, there's a greater need for a balance there. So <coughs> and one of the things, just to finish, we didn't mention anything about in vitro meat, which I know is controversial, but it's a technology that's being developed. Obviously, we have the, the great interest in eating that burger this year that was being developed in a test tube environment. Now, that's not everyone's cup of tea, but you know, somewhere along the line, that technology could develop where you could produce meat in that way and take away a lot of this intensive use of animals to and maybe at the same time drive people towards a more plant-based diet at the same time. I don't know, how do you sort of tackle an issue like that from within the Green Party perspective? Our position on, it, on the in vitro meat um, is quite interesting because we were, we were asked. Um, and obviously there are a lot of benefits to it. You know, we just don't have this cruelty on an industrial scale that we have at the moment. Um, on the environmental aspect, there simply isn't enough known. There's not enough out there. Um, what is actually going in, you know, what are the inputs, what's, what's the waste. Um, I think it's a very early experimental stage and that information simply isn't there. Um, you know, we would like that information and we'll, we'll keep an eye on things. I think the point you make about, um, well, I think the point you were making is that the, the market has been just allowed to run away with this and the corporates are now making these decisions for us. Mm -hmm. And actually for Greens that is a massive problem, not just in um, food system and the agricultural system, but across the board. And we're, you know, we are a party that um, you know, does not believe that the market should just be allowed to run free and that we need to regulate it. And that is across, across the field. And again, unfortunately, there are some very worrying developments. Um, something doesn't sound very fascinating, but something I think we all need to be aware of is something called TTIP. It's the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. It's a trade, in, it's a trade um, agreement that's currently being debated between the EU and the US. And again, there are massive corporate interests on both sides, but particularly US, big law firms, who are really pushing for this to go through. Because what it means is that US corporations will be able to freely import their things into the EU, even if they do not meet our EU standards. And if we try and block them, so for example, if we try and block, as we do currently, beef that has been given hormones, we will be sued. If we try and import chickens that have been washed in chlorinated water because the way they're produced is so disgusting that they're a health risk, this is what happens in the US, and they want to import them into our markets, we can't block them, we will be sued. And this also, the TTIP is not just about animals. It's about environmental regulations, it's about workers' rights, it's about our fundamental protections that we have fought for in Europe, about them being lost. So, fortunately, many other, the, the other parties are supportive of this. The Greens are the only ones who are really making a fuss and being against it, but we will continue to fight this because it really could set us back. All our achievements, it could really set us back. So, there is a petition, you know, find out something about it, talk to your MP, you know, pressure, you know, it can make a difference. A lot, of, a lot of MPs, they, you know, or MEPs, what's your MEPs? You know, they go along with these things. They don't necessarily find out all the information. And if we ask them to, if we put pressure on them, 
than they, than they will often. Thank you, John.